you build a habit of journaling, it isn't always going to be something like, oh my gosh, this changed my whole life today. But you build a habit. And when you can build a habit somewhere, you can build it somewhere else. And so getting athletes to understand that you're eight minutes a day, you can do it. Like you can do it, you can have a journaling practice. Welcome to What I Meant to Say. I'm your host, Wendy Jones, and I'm here today with Priscilla Tallman, a mental skills coach and volleyball player. She's had an amazing Instagram perspective that I've really enjoyed, so I decided to have her on today, and I'm so glad you could join me. I'm so glad, too, and it's. Uh, I think we have a lot of friends in common as well. I was looking through the people you've had on before, and we have lots of people in common, so. Oh, I love it. I, You know, volleyball is a small world, and some place that I have always loved. I didn't grow up in a in a big volleyball community, but as my life went on, you know, got to Cal Poly and just kept learning and I got cut from my college team, but that was really the thing that made me realize how much I loved the sport and kind of set me off on a health journey. So you and I have kind of different stories, but they all, are, you know, revolve around volleyball. Tell me a little bit about your, um, your sporting background and then we'll get into what you're doing today. Yeah, so I actually grew up in a very hot bed for volleyball. I'm not sure it would have been considered that when I started playing, but um, my city is Austin, Texas is where I grew up. So I grew up going to Longhorns, Texas Longhorns game. My dad is a graduate at the University of Texas. And actually in the very beginning, before all of this club thing was kind of crazy, my sister and I were in the very first class of Austin juniors. And so we had this like high caliber coaching at a very young age before anybody knew what all of this stuff was. Uh, and I think one of my favorite things was we used to be ball girls for the Texas games. So before they had like anything, it was us in these like t-shirts that they ironed on the letters on. It was called Mix Magic. So Mick as in Mick Haley, yep, Mix yep. Magic. And we just rolled the balls down the court and we were just, it was such a big deal. So. That's how I got my start. I ended up playing at the University of Georgia in Athens, which I thought was very similar in vibe to Austin because it had music vibe and uh, university vibe and big football and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I played at Georgia and then um, was fortunate enough to actually play a couple years with the national team. So I was still in college and played a couple of uh, tours with the national team um, and went to World University Games my senior year and then played one season of professional volleyball in Europe, in Switzerland. And then, um, I don't know, 15 years later, started coaching. <laughs> That's the short of it. <laughs> I I love it. And I did not know you were from Austin. I did know you played at, at Georgia, but Kathy Litsky is absolutely one of my favorite people on the planet. And our sons play together at Stanford, then that's how I met her. So there's so much great volleyball history in Austin and Glenn and Kathy are absolute legends. Um, and the 100%. stories of the boys go play a tournament. They've started this first um, first point challenge that um, brought men's volleyball to Austin. So um, we've been there the last couple of years and it's, it's amazing to see how they've grown that tournament. It's incredible. It's incredible. And uh, you know, what I love is that um, Austin or in another, we get on a tangent of Texas volleyball, but they've always had yeah. such an established um, sort of like rep, rep, reputation of, of what they do in there. And Gregory is one of those places, like if you've not watched a match in Gregory gym, it is, it's smaller. You're not going to get the Nebraska um, attendance in there, but it's just a different thing. And I took my husband, my husband played at Long Beach state and I oh, took cool. him to his first game at Gregory. And he was like, uh, this is the coolest thing ever. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's got a great culture, a great, um, history of just what that, what that program has always been about. And yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. It sounds like you came from a really, um, not just a sporting based, um, you know, performance place, but like a real values, knowing Glenn and Kathy, like that, the values based, um, athlete. And I can see that in the content you put out today um, and the athletes that you're working with. Um, tell me a little bit about, you know, that transition and where you're, you know, where you're, what you're doing today. Yeah. So um, I actually really was interested and have been interested in this, in this work. I wouldn't have known this is what it was, but since high school and I wanted to get, I got my undergraduate degree in psychology and I just knew that the struggles that athletes go through um, I knew they weren't just mine. I knew that whether it's um, an issue with a coach 
or an issue with a program or values within a program, I, I knew somehow that, that it could be better. And so I sort of kind of did all that. I went and played professional, got my undergraduate degree, which I could do nothing with because it was just a degree in psychology. And so after I finished sort of my playing career, I got my master's in clinical psychology. And that's when it really opened up my eyes to not just um, what are athletes going through, but sort of the why behind we end up, you know, um, acting a certain way or why we, why we um, feel a certain way. Um, I had a lot of anxiety, I would say as a child, um, all through my club years, I had um, anxiety that I wouldn't have known was anxiety, but because you just got up and did it again. You didn't know to take care of yourself yeah. at 9, 10, 11. You didn't know how to communicate to a coach, like what you needed. You almost, uh, even in your home, didn't know what to communicate. So um, graduate school really opened that up for me because I'm like, whoa, this is, um, these are all the things I was missing. Um, and you have to go to therapy when you're in your graduate program. So that opened up a lot of doors for me. <laughs> Everything you just said gave me the chills. Hmm. I mean, when you go back to one, it's such a gift to have a memory, right? That goes back to being nine, 10, 11 years old. And yet we don't know at those ages. And, and oftentimes I feel like a lot of athletes are really body-based and sensitive. And we, you know, we are acting out, you know, our performance through, but our feelings are like right there under the surface, right? And if we don't know what to do with those things, we don't realize how much they can hold us back, how our nervous system is interacting with our mm. play. And so everything you just said right there, like I didn't learn that stuff until so much older and through life experience. And when I figured, started figuring these things out, it, it really does just open up so many doors. So for you to be able to work with athletes you know, in their, while they're still playing and help them see how it can affect their performance on the court and then also enhance their life, which is, we, we all know is so much more important than anything we do on the court, but it's all, it all fits together. So, you know, tell me um, a little bit about what you're doing with those athletes today when you yeah, integrate well, those things. Yeah. Well, actually, and, and kind of going back to sort of something you said early on in there is that, um, we are body based. And I think a lot of that, we are really trained to sort of stuff it in there. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's a physical pain or it's an emotional pain, we don't have an outlet for it. So we use sport as an outlet. We say, oh, this is the expression of it. This is where I get to do these things. Um, you know, I could say if I have um, and have been and was told as a young athlete that I had attitude problems. Um, that attitude is actually things that are hurting me or things that are I feel anxious about or things that are said to me that I don't know what to do. And so I acted out on the court. Um, and I think that's that's a big piece of it is understanding like we don't know any of that. And so the expression is the sport. I think it's why so many people have trouble transitioning out of sport. It's because this is their outlet for emotional and physical pain and then when you're done, the, nothing will ever meet that outlet. Like, like when I work with pro athletes who are finished playing, we, you know, we'll talk about like, there's, there's nothing in the world that's going to meet what that feels like <laughs> to compete at a high level, to get to be aggressive. Like I can't be aggressive in my day-to-day -day life. That's not yeah. appropriate almost anywhere. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you, you lose a big piece of that ability to express. Um, so I think you know, that's kind of what my hope is for, for working with athletes. Uh, I, the, the tools that I use to get good at volleyball were not healthy and they were not sustainable. <laughs> oh, let's get into that yeah. a little bit. Can you get that more, more detail on what, what were those tools that, that were not healthy for you? Yeah, I think it's, it was anger. Um, it was, uh, you know, like the chip on your shoulder, I'll show you kind of stuff. And, um, you know, you know, family of origin history, I, um, skipped a grade. So I skipped third grade and I was two years younger than everybody. So I graduated high school when I was 16. Um, and oh, wow. I ended up graduating college when I was 20. Um, and so like all the things that I was doing and accomplishing, I was doing two years younger than, than everybody else. But, um, I didn't really know 
that it, I, it wasn't okay for, for me to not be good at my sport. Cause I was, if I was a sophomore, I would have been 14 years old, a 14 year old sophomore, it didn't matter. Cause I still had to make a team with 16 year olds. Um, and so, wow. the, yeah, the tools that you have to use to accommodate for physical skill, mental toughness and emotional stability, I'm using a whole different skill because I'm a, I'm not even emotionally developmentally where those 16 year olds are. Um, but I'm also not physically there. I don't have mental toughness yet and it doesn't matter because I still need to make a team and I still am competing with people that are older than me. So just looking at that kind of stuff is, is those are the things, the skills, uh, anger would be it chip on my shoulder. I'll show you kind of attitude stuff that, um, it doesn't help me today, but it got me there. And a lot of times people will say, well, you're an all American and you played pro volleyball. Like, I want to be like that. And I was like, do you? <laughs> like, Yeah. You, you know? touched on a lot of things there because I've had, yeah, I mean, the big word that you used there was sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. I continually, the older I get, I'm looking at what is the sustainable high performance, right? How do we get to that point where what we do feels good in our body, mind, and spirit, and we can continue that road to getting better, right? Because there's a closeout when we're using some of those coping mechanisms mm -hmm. that we hit a wall, right? And everything you just described really does show, I mean, amazingly tough, incredible yeah. for what you, to, to, to rise to that level at that young age, like that is incredibly difficult to do, but I hear that close out in the story. And then the things that you learn post by digging in and learning, you know, going through the education that you've gone through and learning how to turn to those things, but that's not easy to do, to just, to reflect and know that there was something missing. Like, how do you think you got to that point where you knew, you know, something had to be different and that other people, you could help athletes to learn to be better in a different way? Yeah. Um, I have always sort of been almost like an intuitive person. Um, maybe it's because I, I'm a quiet, more quiet person and I just observe a lot. Like I'll watch people and sort of observe and, and that. So I, I tend to be an intuitive person. And um, I, there were things when I was playing and, and I was young, I knew I could do it. I knew I could do what the coaches were asking me to do, but I didn't know how to get it out. And so it's the same way of kind of how I'm working with athletes now. And, and what brought me along this journey is like, I know I will always double down on myself. If people will just give the opportunity, like when I was little now, it's like people give opportunities because I'm an adult and I got an education and I had experience. Right. But when you're right. little, like if someone could just like peel back that curtain and say, Hey, like, I, I know you have something let's, let me be patient with you to kind of work through some of that. Right. Um, instead of saying, well, she's not doing it or she can't do these things and whatnot. So when I coach, I'm always observing and looking for those things. I get a lot of resistant athletes and they're my favorite because I know the resistance isn't against me. It's not because they can't do something. The resistance is, I know I can do this. I don't know how, maybe you didn't communicate the drill to me. So I I'm confused. Um, and so I just sort of kind of look at that and observe and kind of pick at it a little bit and, and go around sort of, instead of hitting it head on in some of those athletes, we just kind of walk around <laughs> the other side of it and see what's over there. And then I walk around the other side and I see, maybe if I said it this way, or maybe if I, um, demonstrated the drill or let her be the, the demo and the drill, something like that. Right. It's, it's just about really watching and observing people behave and seeing when there's that moment, like, ah, I got them. Okay. Now we can talk. Now we can learn, you know? Yeah. And I do think the best coaches always know there are so many ways in mm -hmm. and they don't take it personally. Right. Cause every athlete is different. And, you know, we've gone back and forth on like, you know, you can have so many athletes with different learning the way they learn, the way they take in audit the auditory processing. There's so many things that a good athlete can have outside, um, you know, going on outside of their physical performance that as a coach, if you have the ability to navigate, you know, it makes that athlete's experience so much better. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's a, I think that's a real big need out there right now, mm -hmm. because I do think we have a lot of um, athletes that are 
And just the way kids, what they're up against today with, you know, learning challenges and, and so many more diagnoses out there, you know, whether it's auditory processing or, you know, autism spectrum or ADHD, like it does seem like we're dealing with a lot more of that these days. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that a coach that has the ability to really sit back and evaluate what they're dealing with and know that there's more than one way in is, is so huge. I mean, it's such a gift. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, when I first started coaching, I was terrible. I didn't have any of those skills. I just did what I thought I needed to do. Like I got good this way. So these girls will get good this way too. Right. And I coached like a 16 threes team and they were like, this is terrible. Like, I don't want to play this sport, you know, cause like they're just there to have a good time and, um, you know, whatever. And so I stopped coaching early in my twenties and I, I took all that time off and then I had kids and I was like, Oh, like now I get it. Like you, you can't just tell them to do something like you've got to have a relationship and you've got to build this. And, um, and I think along the way, if coaches are open and they're willing, we can heal those broken parts in ourselves. And then we can coach out of the best of us instead of coaching out of our deficit, our, our yuck, our pain, our whatever. And I just see convention centers still filled with coaches coaching out of their pain and coaching out of their deficit instead of saying like, man, let me find out what my strengths are as a coach. Like, I don't need to win nationals. Who am I as this coach? I'm going to go be that person because that's where I'm going to be strongest. And that's, that sort of was my journey through coaching is, um, finding all that broken stuff. And it was cool because I got to coach so many different levels that each time you coach that level, like you're healing that area. Mm -hmm. As I coach a, host, a high school kid, I'm, I'm healing the high school me. As I coach a youth kid in 12s, I'm coaching my 12 year old me. Like, I'm, and you're not doing it on purpose, but you know, in psychology, it's a, it's a parallel process. It's happening. So that is, that's such a beautiful way to put that. And I, I commend you for that because I think there's such a line or it's, it's, it's the absolute opposite of living vicariously, right? Mm -hmm. Like what you're saying, that self-awareness that it takes to coach from your strengths and know where your lack is, but mm -hmm. to really dial in those strengths and heal that part. Can you contrast that with when you say, you know, you see coaches coaching from their pain. And I think the same could be said of parents. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to see the triangle, you know, that parents, coaches, and athletes is always something I'm, I'm kind of dialed into looking at ways we can make that connection better. And what you're hitting on right now is, is so huge, both for coaches and parents. So you wrote something in one of your blogs um, that I reposted about doing the work to know where that that lack is and know where those points are in your life so that you don't put this on your kids or you don't put it on mm -hmm. your athletes. Um, so yeah, d dig into that a little bit for me. You see what I'm getting at, right? Between the vicarious and the, yep. the healing. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, what's tough is that I think we're all going to go through it. We're all going to experience it. I mean, my babies, when they were babies, had Georgia onesies, they had Georgia shoes, they had Georgia football, they had Georgia volleyball, they had all this stuff, right? Like you, you have these big, crazy dreams for your kids and you don't know how to separate that right away. Cause they're like little squishy, you know, future athletes, right? Like, <laughs> and absolutely. So I think the work really is about separating. We've got to be able to separate from our kids at the dreams and goals and visions when they're little you're trying to keep them alive you're trying to keep them growing there's all these things that as they get older it gets to be you know developmentally wise they're they're separating um and so i think that's the work is you got to take a look at yourself and see where am i still hitting in those areas my it's funny my when my son was playing soccer um my husband coached my daughter for a little bit i don't think he coached my son actually they, they both play soccer but when he was coaching my daughter, um, they played and, or he coached her. And so there was all the coaching stuff. Well, when he stopped coaching her, she was old enough to have, you know, she wasn't little. She was having, she had her own coach. He was still coach from the sidelines. And I'm like, dude, you're coaching her. He's like, no, 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 I'm cheering. I'm like, oh no. So I recorded him one time and I'm like, is that coaching or cheering? He's like, oh, that's coaching. And I'm like, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and sometimes we're just not aware because we're like, oh, I'm supporting my kid. I'm, I'm cheering from the sideline. But I remember, and I've heard this so many times on like little like section. I don't know if it's like your podcast or other podcasts, but like my daughter literally just turned around and was like, dad, 
shut up. <laughs> you're my, Good you're for my her. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, and so I think that's, those are those moments. If we're paying attention, you're going to hear that a lot more subtly along the way. You're going to hear your kid telling you to sort of back off or, hey, dad, I got this or, hey, mom, I'm good or, mom, you don't have to tell me that. Like, but we have to, again, you're noticing when you're a coach, you're noticing athletes. How do I coach this person? As a parent, you just have to be noticing and watching. And when are they telling me to back off? When are they telling me to come in and, and have relationship? When do they need connection? Um, I, I just don't think our children need coaching from us as parents. I think they don't need us to put our dreams on them, like you're saying, where it's this like vicarious, this goal for them. They need us to have relationship and they need us to be connected. And they need to be able to just be themselves instead of this collection of all your your dreams for them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think so much of that has to do with us having our own lives Mm -hmm. and being present for them, but letting our goals continue to evolve and turn from the court, you know, to the the game of life. And like, what, you know, as if we are aging athletes, what are those things we learned in sports that we can carry forth? And, you know, that stuff is those lessons I I feel like are part of my parenting, Mm -hmm. but it's not the how did you play today? what was the score? Are you starting? Or, you know, I mean, I want to know if you're injured or stuff right. like that, but I mean, yeah, there's, there's a huge difference. And that is something I remember watching my daughter play for the first time and she was playing middle blocker. And I, I, I remember standing on the sidelines, and like, get, who, get out of the, get out of the way. Oh God. Yeah. You know? And it's like, but even on that first day, I knew I was like, okay, you're going to have to back your way out of this. Right. So well, having the, yeah, yeah. And I, I just think it's funny because like y- you, you think that you, you can handle it. You think that you can do it. And my husband and I have always said, like we had our own experience. So my husband, like I said, played at Long Beach State. He actually is part of the 1991 national championship team. So he has a national championship ring. He's been surrounded by Olympians. Um, we have introduced my daughter to so many people who we've played with. And there, mm-hmm. a lot of them are Olympians. And she's like, mom, how many Olympians do you know? I'm like, well, you've been in the sport long enough, you know a lot. <laughs> but but the idea there is like, I had my own experience, my husband had his own experience, and it was still hard for us to separate that. So imagine those parents who who like really wanted to play in college and didn't, or really yeah. wanted to hit this level and didn't. I think it's probably such a difficult terrain to to go over to to it's it's hard, you know? I think in healing that that parent coach athlete um triangle or just not not healing but wanting it to be better than you know some of the struggles that we see today i'm wondering if you have any input on how how can a parent really trust and let go and let a coach coach and know that their their child is is taken care of in that environment like what are some of the things that a parent can watch for to know that that coach is trustworthy and that it's okay for them to back off and let the coach coach. Yeah. I think, um, one of the things that, that comes up right away is, um, not that the parent has to be a, a, like a, a best friends or a bestie with the coach, but does the coach sort of understand the developmental needs of the child? So not just a physical need for the child, but like emotional and social, uh, needs. Um, you know, there are some clubs that are say like, look, you, I'm not talking to your mom and the kid is 12. Well, that really developmentally, the child doesn't have a vocabulary or language to, um, talk to an adult yet. And so sometimes that's sort of a red flag for me. Like, huh, how, how young are they trying to separate mom and dad? Um, I get it. Parents are hard. I've coached teams and you're like, okay, these parents are tricky and mm-hmm. you've got to navigate that water as a coach. But if we're grownups and we're adults, we should be able to have adult to adult conversations, mature conversations. So no one's blowing up. Um, and that's sort of one of those things I always look for. Like, like, is this coach allowing for a relationship with mom and dad? Um, and again, I know that's tricky because you don't want mom and dad giving them snacks and holding their backpacks and putting their tying their shoes for them. Like there is responsibility on the child as well, but um, that's a biggie. I just think, how does this, uh, coach respond to chaos? Are they somebody who's freaking out at 12 U or nine U or whatever, because they missed a serve? Uh, I watch, uh, like body language. Um, you know, are they throwing their hands in the air? Are they 
um, stomping on the ground because they're upset. Kids pick up on so much of that. Kids can read so much of that. Um, I think as you get older, 18s, 16, upper end of 16, so maybe 17s, 18s, they're kind of ready to handle some some stuff that isn't awesome all the time. Like there's doesn't have to be butterflies and rainbows. Like they're able to handle uh, body language that that isn't awesome all the time. And so as they grow developmentally, I feel like they can handle a little bit more. We can challenge them more. We still have to have relationship and connection, but um, we really want to challenge them more at the upper end. And I think coaches have it backwards because they think, oh, I got to push them when they're young. So they're ready by the time they're 18. And it's like, like they're not ready yet. They'll figure things out. I mean, my kids didn't figure out what they love to do. My 12 year old still hasn't, but my son uh, almost when he was almost 15. And so it takes time to figure it out. And if they don't love the sport, they're certainly not going to stay in it with you yelling at them and, and getting crazy. I will say one thing um, for me personally, and maybe this could help another coach. I don't have a, like a lot of range in my face. Like I don't have a lot of expressions and I had to really work on that, especially with younger athletes because they thought I was mad. And so I've worked on like, when I'm, when I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of like doing it now. Cause I'm like thinking about it, but like setting up a drill, I'm like, okay. And then this is what we, my voice has to go a certain way. And my eyebrows are up and I'm trying to smile. Um, in the college girls, they didn't care. Like, you know what I mean? Like they're like, yeah. that's fine. Coach me. But I think that's even something that we could work on because it's not, not all of us have it, you know? Yeah. And it is part of that human connection, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is part of like letting them see who you are as a person, mm -hmm. and then they can trust you as a coach. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So and when you reflect on your, you go back to your club volleyball days when you were younger, how do you think um, from your experience to the way the world is today, how do you think it's changed for these juniors athletes? I think, well, I think we were able to, we weren't as, I don't know what the right word is, but like we weren't as watched. Like my mom didn't come to everything. My dad famously has said, you guys were so bad. I didn't start watching you till you were in high school. Like he's like, <laughs> I didn't even want to spend my Saturday in those gyms. Um, but like, I, I think it's some, some of that where like, you you know, we were able to, to get through a tournament at the age of maybe 14 by ourselves without someone always there. We were able to like, um, work through some of our things. I mean, that's, that's the positive part of it. The, what's changed on the other side is I think there is the golden egg of a college scholarship. So now there's way more, um, I think, intense training at younger ages. I didn't take one private in my entire life. Like, I don't even know what that is. Like, people ask me all the time, like, right. I don't even believe in privates. And I know they're good for people, but... Um, yeah, but you then know. you have to start watching the reps. I remember somebody, yep. it was an Olympian, standing on the strand watching my son and saying... You realize, and, and he just loved to play. Like he didn't yeah. take a lot of privates, um, maybe a couple over, you know, five or six years. But that athlete telling me, you know, he's taken more swings at 14 than I probably have to this point in my life. And I was like, I remember it registered. Yep. And I thought, you know, because especially when you have a kid that loves to play and they're playing indoor and beach, these kids have a lot of chance for reps. And even if you're not pushing them, they're just having fun. You know, yep. you do come across those kids and then all of a sudden you're like, wow, that is, it's a lot on their bodies. And I yeah. do think that you and I didn't have that in our day. No, we didn't have, I mean, we still had tournaments. Um, we still had stuff. I still don't think it was as many because now they're trying to, they try to get bids to, to the tournaments, which I, I think we did, but it was, it was different. Um, I don't know. And I can't specifically say how, but I just think in terms of like, the system of it, I think the difference is a lot more involvement from the adults and almost kids are like, I guess I'll do this. And they're just kind of in it. Um, yeah. Do you remember asking to play or was it like, did your parents just kind of put you in it? And yeah, we were put in it because my parents both worked full time. So we needed childcare and, um, childcare was volleyball practice at my school that I was at from three 30 to five 30. Whatever sport was happening, that was childcare. And so when the practice was over, then we would walk to this yogurt place um, that was by our school and sit there until my parents could come pick us up. And it was very practical. It wasn't like nobody was looking for a scholarship. 
nobody was doing any of that. We, we were literally, that was our childcare. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as we got on with it and, um, and just, uh, it was at the very beginning, it was, uh, Glenn and this guy named, um, Al Bennett. And then I think Mick might've been involved, but, um, as we all got better and people got better, then it became more of a club and we had tournaments and we had things we were going for, um, but not in the beginning, no. And then by the time, I think by the time I was a so or freshman or sophomore, I was like, okay, I'm definitely doing this. Cause I had been to enough Texas games to know like, that's what I want to go do. <laughs> that's awesome. That's super cool. I want to do that. So yeah. Yeah. And I mean that exposure and that's what I love about the, the fact they brought the, the men's tournament to Texas, you know, that they've built because a lot of young boys haven't seen volleyball, right? That's yeah. not the same as like playing at Long Beach State or living in Southern California where we, we have the exposure. And then of course the, the women's game is huge, but it's fun to see the men's game grow. And it's, it's been fun to, to be friends with them and see how they, the, the effort that they've put into growing the men's game alongside the women's. Well, and I think that might be also one of the ways that it changed as well is like those were I mean, obviously a city that was big with volleyball, but those were like my idols. Like that was so cool to watch that. It was a treat to get to go to a game on a Friday night or whatever. And I really don't think young athletes are spending their time at college games. Um, I don't think they're watching it on TV. Like we watched it, we went to it, we were around it. Um, you know, you had to sit and watch the Olympics at the time it was on. So you would be up late watching volleyball and yeah, um, you're mimicking what they're doing. I did, a. Uh, famously also teach myself famous to me and my husband that's it <laughs> but I, taught myself, I taught myself how to jump serve uh watching eric sato at the uh i want to say 88 i'm trying to think how old i was olympics um but we didn't nobody it. was nobody was jump serving and and so it was like those things that i just don't know if young athletes are doing it i know there are some but um i would say that might be a difference as well yeah well there's a freedom in that in that kind of learning that doesn't exist in a programmed environment, right? And mm -hmm. so if our kids are practicing all the time and everything is so programmed for them, my instinct is, well, maybe they just don't have the time, right? The, to just be free and like take in what they're interested in, you know? Totally. And it can be any sport. I mean, whatever you're glued to or even just watching, because I, at, at this point, will watch any sport and I'm always hooked into the performance and the athlete and the story behind the athlete, but it takes, you know, it, it, you have to have time to do that stuff. And I feel like we're, you know, our athletes are up against serious schedules that we did not necessarily have. Yeah. We actually, um, my son for his freshman year, um, of high school decided to do online school at home. So we do a lot of, I, I call it homeschool. He says online school, but we, we teach a lot. Um, and so, but that was because he's a mountain biker and he wanted to free up his time to do what he loves to do. And he was getting out of school late. He was having homework. They were rushing to get dinner and then getting to whatever, um, you know, ride they were going to do. And, and it, like you're saying, they're so scheduled that, you know, we just sort of remove that barrier from him. He has to manage his time during the day. He has to ask us um, what our schedules are. So we, I mean, you can't just come in here and say, Hey mom, can you help me with English? It's like, Hey, in, in at 10 o'clock can you help me with english so there's schedule management because he's not just going from class to class he has to ask uh his dad and me when we're available um maintenance on his bike which is takes time uh that's his sort of like we call it his tech ed because he's out there and he has to change tires and he's got to work on shocks and he's got to do all this stuff um and so yeah i think for us that was something that became practical like okay if you're going to do this sport it's it's not it's not from five to to six yeah. or five to seven. This is a this is a totally different situation. So, um, yeah, we've we've learned quite a bit watching our kids choose because they haven't chosen ball sports. They have chosen different things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really cool. But that evolution and and you letting go and letting them, you know, not just choose that, but also learn how to manage it. Mm -hmm. because that's where the life skills come in right i mean that's it's it's amazing as parents when we see our kids be able to do that yeah. so beyond the technical skills of volleyball you you know you're the the mental performance side you're doing a lot in that space um and i want to get into the uh, 30 day champions journal and um, the return to play journal that you've written and how that helps the athletes that you work with so tell me a little bit about those 
Yeah. So um, I wrote that uh, just before it would have been summer of 2019. So I had no okay. idea what was about to happen. And I used it with, I was coaching at ASU. And so that was the very first college team to use that journal. Um, and it was called something else at that time. It was this little thing I had printed locally. It was like a spiral bound little thingy. Um, but the coach was like, I was like, hey, can I do with the journal? And he's like, sure. So we did these mindset Mondays and we went through the four weeks of the journal. Um, it's broken into four categories. So the first category is sort of your personal mindset and how to prepare yourself uh, physically, emotionally, and mentally. And then the second week is goal setting. I love the James Clear way of goal setting, which is with systems and habits. It's like my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, so we go through that. And then the third week is communication. How do I speak to other people, but also how do I speak to myself? And then the last week is taking ownership. And the way I do ownership is through value setting and understanding our values. I've said this on one of my, my Instagram things, but um, we know our values we can make better decisions. And when we make better decisions, we are more confident in what we're doing. Um, and so that's kind of the course. The idea is to build a habit, obviously, because the James Clear stuff, right? And yes. you build a habit of journaling. It isn't always going to be something like, oh my gosh, this changed my whole life today. But you build a habit. And when you can build a habit somewhere, you can build it somewhere else. And so getting athletes to understand that you're eight minutes a day, you can do it. Like you yeah. can do it, you can have a journaling practice. Um, and so that's kind of the bulk of it. And then um, I've worked with uh, clubs. So club teams, juniors club teams. I've worked with my high school team, other high school teams, uh, collegiate teams. Uh, LMU actually used a return to play one. Um, mm -hmm. Their beach program used it, I think 2020, 2021 and 2022 season. I think they got third. Not that it was my journal, but I think anybody who's willing to do something different is always going to show up in a way that's like, Hey, like they'll, they'll show the, um, I guess the outcome of, of good stuff. Like I'm thinking differently. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's, a, it's a different way of thinking. And, and a lot of teams are like, no, we already do it. Oh no, I already journal. Oh no, we've got it. Um, but those who are like, okay, I'll try this. Like, it's really fun to watch them do really well. Yeah, no, and that organize the the ability to organize that is is often the key to like when everything's so crazy and the you know schedules are are what they are to be able to really dial in what you're focused on. And I'm a huge journaling um, fan. I'm a, I'm a writer, and I always tell people I'm like honestly five minutes and just write the ugly. It just let it be yeah. ugly, and and then it's amazing what it turns into. So. It's amazing. Yeah. And, and what I, I've kind of always kept one, but I have one that I use um, and I will go back and look through it. And I'll be like, when I make a big decision, I'm like, wow, like I've been thinking about that for three years. Like I can see in the journal that it was coming and, and yeah. you don't know that, but then you look at your, what you're doing and you're like, wow, like that's super cool that I was already thinking about this decision three years ago, but I just wasn't ready for it yet. And that's yeah. what I think I love that process too. Like think about, um, we, you know, what you track in your life. We have watches that track our steps and our biometrics, and we have to make sure there's enough gas in the car. So we track our gas and then we don't track emotions or mental state. Like why not? Like, why wouldn't we track that? You know, it's just as important as all of the other things that we spend so much time tracking. Um, so it's been a, it's been a huge thing. I've just, you know, I wish more teams would do it. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, when, when the teams are ready, I will be there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And helping athletes learn to identify their feelings is it's huge. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, even beyond athletes, but with the people that you work for, work with you, you, the ability to play more free and understand how they're coming into the gym. And man, I, I, I do this work because I, I wish that I always want to help people learn something earlier than I learned it. And mm -hmm. I, I, I see that in your work. I think that's part of what I identify with so much in, in the things that you post. And um, I know the other thing we connected on was uh, being, you know, aging athletes and yes. that 
that feeling that the athlete's always inside of you, right? And mm -hmm. you never really lose the competitive spirit and your body goes through different things and you're going to go through injuries and all those types of things. But give me a little bit of your perspective of, you know, what it's like to be an Asian athlete. Other than that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I know oh, no. there, there's definitely, the struggle is real. Yeah, the, struggle the struggle is real. Is real. Oh, like there's some good, really good things. Like I don't care about like, you know, um, aesthetics, I guess. I don't really care what my body looks like anymore. Um, and I obviously want to take care of it. I also, I obviously want to feel good. So I do things that are going to help me do that for a long amount of time. But um, there's also just the, I'm tired, you know, and can I take, and again, I think it's, it's this idea as an athlete that you're not allowed to be tired. You're not allowed to give something up. Like you have to keep pushing. And I think finally, I don't know, 48, ish maybe i'm like i do not need to do this like and i do i do i'm like i'm not like i'm a free falling into the abyss but i'm i'm definitely not trying to um look a certain way or perform in volleyball like yeah. that's all that's all gone <laughs> yeah yeah well i i had a conversation um not too long ago with a couple of um rising beach volleyball stars and i we were out on the beach at the same time and they were practicing and i we ended up talking like either in between games or after we were done and i said you don't the difference is that this is my free time this is where mm. my mind i let everything go and i come out and i whatever is facing me i feel better about when i'm done playing mm -hmm. and the look on their face because they're trying to get every little thing right and in practice and get, you know, learn new skills and hit the, the cut shot exactly right. And I was like, yeah, I don't, this is, this is absolute free time to me. And it was just like, it was a realization for both of us. And they were like, wow, that sounds really fun. And yeah. then, and then my daughter who just finished playing, um, at TCU is now playing for fun in the evenings and teaching her boyfriend to play. And she calls me, she's like, mom, it's so fun. And I'm like, yeah, it's yeah. fun to play for fun. So that's the reframe I, I try to give people because yeah, the injuries and the the body aches and all of this stuff, it's, it's real, yeah. but the, the playing for fun and I, the, I'm super grateful to be at this point and still enjoy the things that I did younger and just not compare what you yeah. used to be able to do to what you do now. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. Cause I do, I do want to stay fit enough to do things. I don't always want to do volleyball, but like yeah. back riding, like my daughter horse uh, rides horses. So it's fun to go on a horseback ride with them, like on a vacation or something. Um, I tried trapeze, which was really fun. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. I want to try archery. So I'm competitive. So there's things that I still want to do, but I don't always want to express it in volleyball. Like I'm still want to like, challenge myself and see like what else is cool out there like you know absolutely that yeah. I, I i totally agree and i i i always joke i don't do anything where i have to wear shoes because i play beach volleyball i swim yeah. and i do yoga so i'm out yep. i'm i'm out of shoes but the archery thing that's really interesting because yeah. it's a huge mind mindset and breath work and all the things that can go into that. I mean, there is always a new way to challenge ourselves. And I think that is, that's huge. You hear, hear so many people talk about novelty and, mm -hmm. and keeping the brain sharp. I even tried pickleball the other day. Oh my goodness. It's hard. It's, it's too many It's rules. hard. There's too it's many. It's so hard. Yeah. There's too many and It's taking me. the world by <laughs> storm, but it's completely opposite from, at, well, from beach volleyball for sure. So yeah. it's interesting to mix up your mind and let it, you know, do new things, but it's also super challenging. <laughs> I know. And, and I think the reason I stay, I have, I mean, I, I think I stopped doing volleyball when I had to try to demo something, you know, with the college girls. And I was like, this is just, I'm just embarrassed at this point. Right. <laughs> um, so I think doing that doesn't like make me happy anymore. Like, cause I can't recall the muscles don't say, oh yeah, we know how to do that. Like they're just done. They're like, we don't even mm -hmm. know anymore. Um, and that's the only thing that probably keeps me off the sand. I don't mind like my husband and I'll pepper at the beach or, you know, I think we've played one-on-one -on -one or whatever, but yeah, at, when we're at the beach, but you know, yeah. And we live in, we live in Arizona. So we're not like I mean, yeah. we'd have to go to some other court somewhere and figure all that out. So it's a little bit different than. Yeah, Cal absolutely. SoCal. I know <laughs> it's, uh, it's around everywhere down I know. here. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, so one of the questions I ask everybody that comes on my podcast is, uh, you know, what is a piece of advice that you would give to your younger self? 
Oh man, that's a good <laughs> question. Um, you know, I would say that there are people, I, I was not like a mainstreamer. I was not a kid that was in the middle. I was not like, um, like a popular kid, like, and I'm not saying I was unpopular. I just wasn't interested in any of that. And I would just say like your people and the people who think like you and who are curious, they're out there. Like, just be patient, keep being who you are and you will find those people. I think that's what I would say. Cause I, I think, yeah. It, yeah, it's hard when you're young and you're not like everyone else and you think differently and you're, you know, you're like, oh, I should be like all those girls and, and you're not. And Man, I'm glad, can... I'm glad I'm not. And I love, I love all the cute girls and they're all my friends now, but you know. <laughs> I can so identify with that. That's, that's beautiful advice. And it, it yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I think we do have a lot in common, even though we've never met, but a lot of the things that you've said, I'm like, yep, spot on. I, well, I see, we you. found each other and that's what yeah. I would say to my younger self. You will find your people. <laughs> well, and that's what I tell people is the best thing about social media and with all of the drawbacks and all the comparison and all the things that, you know, we could do a whole nother conversation on what that's doing to kids, but they're the the real connection is still there and i always mm -hmm. said like when when facebook first started i said you know facebook shows me who i would be friends with without um if miles didn't make any difference mm, and that's cool and yeah so i do think that that's how we find connections like this and i'm really excited that we got to have this conversation today so keep you know putting out the stuff you're putting out i love sharing it i love hearing it and i think you're doing such amazing things for young athletes and it's desperately needed so Thank you for what you do. And thank you for joining me today. Awesome. Thank you so much. And glad we got a chance to uh, chat it up. <laughs> yeah. And um, I do want people to know um, where they can find you to connect. So wh what's the best place to find you? Yeah, currently I just do Instagram. It's at spike doctor three. We never went over why it's that, but S P I K E D R three. And then my website is spike doctor S P I K E D R.com. And I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on all the old lady stuff. That's it. I am. <laughs> I hear you on that. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, like I said, keep doing what you're doing. And thank you so much for joining me on What I Meant to Say today. Thank you for joining us on What I Meant to Say, another production of Inspired Edutainment brought to you by Be Better Media.